I just want to kind of put a, a further defined mental toughness. I want people to understand that it's not going to come through like the kid that runs extra sprints after practice. Man, the kid is so mentally tough. This is what coaches say. Yeah. You know, when um, the race is on the line, it's the kid that pushes the hardest and has their lungs bleeding and like they're so mentally tough. That's physical toughness. Mental toughness is this zen like unrattleable. You can't be shaken. No matter what somebody does to you, you can't be flustered. You don't get frustrated. You don't get um, thrown off your game. Doesn't matter if you're down by 20 points. Doesn't matter if you've experienced three failures in a row. Doesn't matter if we ask you to do this undaunting task. Doesn't matter if the social media haters say this, that, or the other thing, or if commentators say this, that, or the other thing. No matter what happens, you can't be thrown off your game. Mm -hmm. That's mental toughness. We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to live on the run, always chasing, never stopping. Hello and welcome back to Chasing Excellence. How are you, Ben? I'm doing great. Thanks, Patrick. Today, as promised, we are going to dive a bit back into the TED Talk that you gave and the the and a continuation of the conversation we had going behind the scenes of that TED Talk. Um, and we promised in that episode that we were going to do a deep dive on uh, mental toughness, which was the source code of your TEDx talk. Um, mainly because you had, what did you have, like 13 minutes in the TED Talk or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. So, it was supposed to be 12 and yeah. it went 13. They, <laughs> they gave me that grace period. So we want to go uh, We want to go even deeper than, than they allowed uh, on the TED stage. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to dive into, um, I don't know, is it fair to say kind of the stages of mental toughness or how would you, how would you yeah, layer I would, out the- I would call it the development of. Okay, cool. So you have, um, you've got some steps that everybody can take to uh, develop or further further develop their own mental toughness. Um, and we're going to get into each one of those steps today. Before we do, I'm just going to give a uh, kind of a Cliff's Notes version of what is to come. So the six steps, become a learner, expect adversity, set your sights, learn your triggers, kill the critic, seek out practice, and mental... Uh, oh, nope, that's, that's it. it. Seek out practice. Sorry, yeah. my, my notes are just a little messed up there. Okay, so those are the six steps that we're going to get to. But before that, I thought it was really important to take a 30,000 foot view on the idea of mental toughness. Why mental toughness? Why should we pay attention to it? Why have you spent so much time paying attention to it? Um, uh, And and so let's let's start there. Just the just the why of it. Yeah, absolutely. So regardless of what we're what we're chasing, whether it's uh, be better um, athletes, better um, business people, better parents, whatever it is. We, we've talked about the development of how to get there a couple of different ways in a couple of different forms, but basically the, the, the tip of the, of the spear, the tip of the pyramid, the top, the last little icing on the cake is, um, like your strategy on how you are going to yeah. execute these things yep. in order to execute certain strategies. Let's say that we're, um, developing a, a football team and we want to run the West coast offense. We have to have certain skill sets. We have to have a quarterback that can read the defense really fast. Um, wide receivers that can um, basically like slot receivers that can uh, get open really quickly. So in order to execute strategies, you have to have certain abilities. Well, to have certain um, um, abilities, you need to follow a certain practice. You need Mm -hmm. a process to follow in order to get there. You need to do certain drills that will get you fast. You need to do certain drills that will allow you to read defenses. Well, those things are 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 tough. Like being able to be super committed to the the nuances of the process is really hard, and that's what um, that's why we dive so hard into character. Being able to follow the process takes patience. Mm-hmm. It takes fortitude, focus, grit, tenacity, um, all those character traits that we associate with high achievers. Well, all those character traits are synonymous or pu- coupled together 
equal mental toughness. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is be tough enough to be able to not be distracted by all the external stimuli that's coming in, whether it's during a practice, during a game, by high stakes, um, by pressure, by um, anything that might take you away from the process, which is the thing that leads to great results. A lot of people focus on achieve certain goals, Mm -hmm. but goals are just the result from which forth you put an effort. Now, what everyone focuses on there is the result. What I'm saying is the result is unknown, unknowable, and you can't control it. So instead of focusing on the result from which forth you put an effort, let's focus on the effort. The Mm -hmm. effort is the process that you follow to get there. The effort can only be followed if you're mentally tough. Mm -hmm. Now, The second side of that is when you talk to these super high achievers in any one of these sports or any one of these um, endeavors, they all claim that like, hey, at this level, everyone's fit, everyone's talented, everyone's good. What comes down to the difference maker is what's between their ears. And everyone talks about that, but no one's talking about how to get there. Mm -hmm. My contention is we've been chasing it completely wrong. Coaches and athletes are chasing mental toughness wrong. They're chasing it by it. This is what happens is first off, they're they're labeling it wrong. They don't know what it is, so they're they're saying it's something that's not. Last year during the playoffs um, for the NHL, the Bruins, Chara, their defensive captain, broke his jaw. He went in the locker room, got all sewn and stitched up, came back on the bench and watched the rest of the game on the bench with a broken jaw and teeth missing. All that. And everyone's like, oh my God, the mental toughness. There's overlap. That is, there's some mental toughness there, but that's toughness, dude. <laughs> that's pain tolerance. Mm-hmm. What I'm saying is to do any of the things that we're about to talk about, you don't need to be tough. There is a difference between physical toughness and mental toughness. That's why I don't even like the terminology mental toughness because people are yeah. Im- immediately making these leaps to yeah. what we associate, what what actually is physical toughness. Brett Favre, you know, gets knocked out of the game with a concussion and comes back in back in the day. Um, athletes crawling towards the finish line of a triathlon, like the mental toughness, the grit and the tenacity, that, that's just being tough. They might have very little mental toughness. What I'm talking about is a lot closer to like um, what you might learn about through Stoic philosophy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a lot what you might learn about... Um, through like uh, self-help. Um, the idea is don't be rattled. Don't be distracted. Don't be overcome by emotion or stakes or anything else. The fact that we do get any of those things, the fact that we do get freaked out about failure, the fact that we get freaked out about um um, the stakes being so high, you know, taking the last shot of a game, national championship, you're taking um, the last inbound pass. And you're, if you're thinking about the consequence of what's going on, the chance of you being successful are a lot less than if you are just literally super mentally confident, whatever you want to mentally tough. You know, I call it a weaponized mind where it's no longer a shield, which I feel like is what most people talk about with mental toughness. They feel like it's a shield to protect them. Well, a weaponized mind is on offense. It's not a shield. It's a spear. It can actually be used as a weapon, as an advantage. It's not a thing that will keep you in the game. It's a thing that will help you win. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with this and the reason it's so hard and the reason people are so distracted and they are so... um, um, fearful and they um, fear consequence, they fear pressure and they fear mistakes is because it's built into our DNA. It's a survival mechanism. Back in the day when we were chilling in, out by the campfire outside the caves, we it was all about survival. Our whole species was built around survival. So we had these hormones built into us to help us survive. And When we heard a twig go snap in the woods, we would all jump, turn really quickly because we had a hormonal response. We had a fight or flight reaction that said like run away or fight, like fight or flight. It's you switch from this, we're chilling by the campfire, eating our, you know, deer that we caught or whatever it is. 
and we are in this parasympathetic nervous system, we immediately flip. You get this, all the blood rushes, you get this adrenaline surge, and you need to fight or flight away from that because it might be a saber-toothed tiger that caused that twig to go snap in the woods. Mm -hmm. It's built into us. Well, we don't have saber-toothed tigers anymore. The, The twig going snap in the woods doesn't exist. The other part of it is that the survival mechanism is equally important to survival. Is it's not getting eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. It's getting shunned by the group. So what happens is after Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it goes food, shelter, survival, sex, whatever it is, because it's all about survival and reproduc- uh, get the species to survive. After those things are met, it literally goes to hierarchical needs, Mm -hmm. which is how important am I in the group? And the higher your importance in the group, the greater your chance of survival. Because we want the best of our mungus to reproduce. We want those ones to be safe. So you'll get first choice of mate and food. That's really important and shelter. So we will will protect you. We will take care of you because you're so important to the group. Said another way is the least important, the more the the less important the the le- the less important that you are to the group, the more likely are you are to be pushed out of the group and die of exposure in the woods. Mm-hmm. Said another way, if we deem that you are weak and that you no longer produce value to the tribe, what is the point of keeping you around? You are now just a liability that we have to feed. So instead, we push you to the woods. You get fed to the saber tooth tigers. You know, like, so what we do as a as a species is try to make ourselves fe- and look more and more and more important. What this means is don't show weakness, don't show failure. If you fail, if you're weak, we are going to say, whoa, we don't need him. Let's get him out of here. And you again die from exposure. The whole system, hormones, is set up around those two things essentially. To keep you alive, that's why we have fear, basically is to keep you alive. Well, those things don't exist anymore. There is no fear of being shunned and pushed out of your home and dying from exposure. It's not going to happen. In fact, the, the, the most unique among us are the ones that are most likely to succeed now. It's the exact opposite. It's okay to fail because you iterate and you learn. This whole thing that we're set up, that I'm going to set up, is basically built around one premise. And it's the same premise that any um tech company would understand this is how all modern companies are built now it's the it's the lean startup method right it's lean um organizations lean management which is you build measure learn change so what we're going to do is through this whole system everyone's going to look for the actionables where is the thing it's like is it journaling is it um cold exposures is it um you know, going up and kissing a stranger, like it can be whatever. I wouldn't recommend doing that. Yeah. So the, one of my friends did as a, as a 40 before 40. And one of the things was go kiss a stranger. Mm -hmm. Um, tangent alert. (laughs) Um, so the idea behind this, yes, I can give all these different like tactics and these little things. Yes. Go try this. It's that's going to, when we get to the practice, it's going to come full circle about what we mean by that. The biggest thing as we're listening through these six steps is that you realize it's not about the tools, the tactics, or the tricks. It's about one thing, and that is awareness. You have to become aware of what each of these five steps means. And the more that you run this through your filter in your brain constantly, it's not like you hear the podcast, you read the book, and then you like step away and it's gone, but you do the tactics. If you don't become aware of how the whole system, the whole loop is working, because one of these builds on the next. You can't just go right to the practice. You won't get there, which is what all these people are trying to do through building mental toughness. They're just doing the practice. Mm. So they're doing the really hard workouts. They're doing David Goggins, go run a hundred miles, go to these incredibly and crazy stuff. But all they're doing, if they're doing that is building up physical dominance. Mm-hmm. The mind is getting these little drips because there's like, there's no, like you're not in gears. There is right. like right. this overlap. So you're getting some just by being exposed to it. But if you don't deal with the underlying principles behind this, the foundation, which is the five steps before the practice, we are not going to move the needle we could otherwise. Yeah. Is, is, and with something we've talked about before is the notion of, uh, I'm the type of person who, right. Yeah. Dot, dot, dot. And, and that's what I'm hearing from what you're saying about the, the, whoops, sorry, the, the whys behind all this stuff yeah. is, is changing 
at least who you think you are so that you then have the tools necessary to make the decisions. The whole, yeah, if you can get to like, I'm the type of person that we're pretty far along in this journey. That's kind of like the, the second to last step. Got it. Um, what we need to do is do some stuff before, because otherwise you're just lying. Mm-hmm. You're hoping that you sell yourself that <laughs> yeah. enough, 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 enough that you start to sort of quasi believe it. And that can work. It just takes a lot longer. It takes a lot more repetition, a lot yeah. more exposures. We can speed this thing up. Essentially what we want to do, I just want to kind of put a, a further defined mental toughness. I want people to understand that it's not going to come through like the kid that runs extra sprints after practice, man, the kid is so mentally tough. This is what coaches say. Yeah. You know, when um, the race is on the line, it's the kid that pushes the hardest and has their lungs bleeding and like they're so mentally tough. That's physical toughness. Mental toughness is this zen like unrattleable. You can't be shaken. No matter what somebody does to you, you can't be flustered. You don't get frustrated. You don't get um, thrown off your game. Doesn't matter if you're down by 20 points. Doesn't matter if you've experienced three failures in a row. Doesn't matter if we ask you this undaunting task. Doesn't matter if the social media haters say this, that, or the other thing, or if commentators say this, that, or the other thing. No matter what happens, you can't be thrown off your game. Mm -hmm. That's mental toughness. It's a focus thing, not a fitness thing. Love that. Um, before we get into the first stage or step, um, you 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 mentioned that there is some carryover, some 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 back and forth between being physically tough might lead to some mental toughness. Have you seen in your experience mentally tough people also become more physically tough? Oh, absolutely. That's okay. I mean that's the whole. Is deal. that the game? That's the deal. It's like okay. If you get more mentally tough, you develop the character. Better better people make better athletes. Got it. That's the idea. If you become this. I mean, Catherine David's daughter is the number one prime example, right? Like, your this isn't, I didn't like, I didn't, um, just like develop this. This came, well, no, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I know but, what you mean. You didn't just wake up one day. Yeah. Like, I didn't. It it's just, like, this yeah. was like kind of like iterating. I kind of saw it through experience. Yep. I didn't like have this put in place. And yeah. it was like, oh, I'm piecing it all together. And the, me working with athletes and me, you know, trying to see how the elite coaches are working with their athletes from the all blacks to the Patriots, to Rafael Nadal, to um, Michael Phelps, to all these different, um, athletes, to John Wooden, how, and I'm piecing it together. Like no one's actually, I don't want to take all the credit. I mean, they're the ones that are doing that created this thing. I'm just piecing it together and putting in a nice little package. Got it. Um, but absolutely like Katrin, when I started working with her, I'm not saying I'm the one that reason I did this. We did it together. Mm-hmm. Um, she was, she went to the games twice before finished in 20th and 23rd and 27th. Like there's only 40 athletes there. She's mm-hmm. a ba- a mediocre at best athlete. The next year she missed the games. So she wasn't even there. We started doing this stuff. And the next year she wins the games. Yeah. And the next year after that, she wins the games. And now she's the only female athlete that's finished in the top five, five years in a row. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's not the harder training set. She's doing the same stuff. She was, she's still doing the thrusters, the clean jerks, the pull-ups, the running, the rope. That's all yeah. the same. Like yep. that stuff hasn't changed. What's changed is her mental approach to it. It's not the, it, here's the other thing about mental toughness. It's not about the critical time, which is what everyone thinks. It's not when, um, it. it's not like, it's not when, when the your, game's on the line, their games. Yeah. Exactly. It's not at that crucial moment. It's every single day in these tiny little moments, the tiny, tiny things that people just pass by all the time. Those are the moments, both that forge it for that moment, because it won't be there otherwise, but it's also those moments are the ones that make the difference in terms of the physical development. Mm -hmm. If you want to be dominant physically, the shortest the shortcut to that is what's going on between the years. If you get that fixed, like the physical dominance, because we're all doing the same stuff. Mm-hmm. The difference between what Michael Phelps is doing and what the 13th place finisher at the Olympics is doing in terms of training is we wouldn't be able to tell the difference. We mm-hmm. couldn't see the difference mm-hmm. at all. It would not matter at all. I'm telling you, it's what's happening between his ears that's the difference. It's the approach that he takes to that training. Okay, let's dive into the approach then. The first one is becoming a learner. Okay, so this is um, the idea that it's it's about, again, this is an awareness thing. Mm-hmm. So ha- basically become aware of your thoughts, become aware of your words, because they're going to dictate actually whether you believe that you can become mentally tough or I've had people actually point out, this is, 
I, I mean, I just feel bad. It's, I feel that point out studies that say being mentally tough is something you're born with. And there's studies that back that up. And I just look at those studies and I look at those people and my heart breaks for them because this is not how it works. Like, how do you explain Katrin then? A girl that cried on the competition floor to like the picture perfect, fierce competitor. Like, if we're born with it, why didn't she have it before? I mean, it's just ridiculous to believe that you can't develop mental toughness. The first step is the belief that you can become mentally tough. It's not something you're born with. In fact, we're born with the opposite. I already told you, it's built into your DNA for survival. It's built in your day. It's built into your DNA to fight or flight. It's built in your DNA not to have this mental toughness. It's built in your DNA to be, I'm not saying toughness, Toughness is built in your DNA. We're survival Mm -hmm. machines, Mm -hmm. but you are built to be distracted. You got something going on. Well, twig goes snap in the woods, and you're. I gotta pay attention to that. Oh my gosh, what what did they say? Because now you're worried about what the naysayers are saying. Do they worried about the gossip? Worried about you're so. We are distraction machines. In order for us to stay focused, you have to believe that you can weaponize your mind. That you can develop mental toughness. It's not a DNA thing. You are actually built in the other way. It's this paradigm shift that we need to take. Said another way, it's this is this is the growth mindset, right? Mm-hmm. This is what Carol Dweck popularized that um it is all about yes, it's it's a hard fight because your whole upbringing from the way that you were talked to as a kid to your education to your coaches to your environment has shaped your belief system. Your belief system is lying to you. The truth is it can be developed and it's been proven over and over and over again. We have to realize this is something that you can develop. And the easiest example of this is what Carol Dweck explains in Mindset is that example of um, they gave a, a test where they gave um, test results back to first graders. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna, maybe it's not first graders. Kindergarten, young um, elementary school students. One group, group A, got a note on the top that said, good job, you're really smart fixed trait, smarts, intelligence. The other group got a test back that said, good job, you worked really hard. Not fixed, effort. This is something that you can work, you can sliding scale. Mm -hmm. They then retook a test that was a grade or two above them in terms of difficulty. The kids that were told that they were really smart, they gave up. They just didn't push through. They didn't have mental toughness. Whereas the kids that were told that that they worked really hard, something you can develop, did phenomenal. They did much, much better than the other group where before they both scored the same. The way you talk to your kids, the way you talk to your peers, the way you talk to yourself is going to dictate what path you go on. If you say, oh, I'm just not really, like a workout comes up and you go like, well, I'm just not that strong. Yep. Then what you're saying is it's fixed. You're not going to get there. If you say um, to your kids, like, um, like, wow, great job on that test. You're really smart. Like, it's, it's the same example. We need to work and talk to ourselves in terms of effort, in terms of focus, in terms of things that we can move, not in terms of fixed traits. And that will help us get into this lifelong learner mode instead of like pass fail at every opportunity. Nothing is pass fail. There is no pass fail. If Katrin doesn't win the CrossFit Games, it's not a fail. It's a learn and you iterate. Now, it hurts like hell. It didn't meet our ex- what we wanted to do, mm-hmm. but it doesn't mean it's a fail. It's just another step in the development process. There is no failure. Like Get yourself out of that pass-fail mode, fixed, get into the growth and the learner mindset. Mm-hmm. If you want a tactical, if you want, to, you want something to do there, what I would do is I would redefine what success means to you. Mm. So what most people do is they put success in terms that are outside of their control. I want to get an A on the test. I want to be valedictorian. I want to be an all-star. I want to get into an Ivy League school. I want to win the CrossFit Games. All outside your control. If you define success in terms of what you can control, I want to give my very best effort regardless of circumstances. Well, okay. Like mm-hmm. Now, actually, like bad circumstances become an opportunity. Like mm-hmm. Let's shape success. Like I, I, want to win, I want to make a million dollars. Okay, that's fine. Then what happens if every single person you know is now making $5 million? Is it still going to be a million dollars? Probably not. Like, these are arbitrary marks that we're putting. And say, like, I want to um, I want to stare down adversity and overcome it and look at, put success in terms of your, so reframing success would be a tactile approach to that. Mm-hmm. Would that, reframing um, success, is that 
similar uh, or can you do a similar thing to goals because i think a lot of goals end absolutely up looking like i want to make a million dollars completely year yes right? that's exactly what i mean yeah, yeah. so reshape your goals reshape your now it might change it away from being smart because it's right like, yeah that's yeah, what it, i was thinking and where, I, i'm where not a big is. i'm not a big fan of smart goals here's the way i want if you're working with me and you're an athlete i want i want to know um tell me your goal and it would be to win the crossfit games cool put it in the top shelf we never need to talk about that again because everyone's goal there is to win the CrossFit Games. It's right. not the differentiator. Right. What is the differentiator is what you're doing below that goal, right? Which is the process and the character development. I need to know if it's the CrossFit Games or you're trying to be an entrepreneur, you're trying right. to be a dad, yes. you're trying to, yep. I need to know exactly what you're going, you're trying to lose 30 pounds. Like I need to know that. Outside of that, I never need, I never need to hear it again. All we need to talk about after that is character and process, character and process. Mm -hmm. Cool. And part of that process is to expect adversity. Yes. Oh, good. What a segue. <laughs> Look at you. Okay. So here's the deal with expecting adversity is, um, it's coming for you. Yes. It's going to happen. Like you're going to be down by 20 points. You're going to be outside the top 10. You're going to get injured. You're going to get the call in the middle of the night. You're going to get that project thrown in your lap when you had a weekend planned with your family. You're going to dot, 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 dot. You're going to get stuck in traffic. They're going to spill coffee on you. A stranger is going to yell at you. They're going to say crap about you on social media. All of those things are going to happen. They are all going to happen. You are not a special snowflake that is immune to any of this. It has a part of being a human being. For us to say it's going to be a perfect gold brick road that we're going to go on and there's going to be no bumps and it's going to be air conditioned and we're going to have cruise control and we're going to have Netflix playing along the way. Like That isn't reality. We need to be extreme realist. Embrace the harsh realities that it means to be a human being. Now, this is not a negative thing at all. It's actually a very positive thing because what happens is as you start to realize these things, everything that you're experiencing becomes that much happier. It's actually called the happiness equation, but happiness is expectations minus reality. Mm -hmm. So if you're going on a cross-country flight and they say um, that you have uh, that you have Wi-Fi and then half hour into the flight, you're on Wi-Fi, it kicks out you no longer have Wi-Fi, you're like, crap, like the expectation was you were gonna have Wi-Fi, now you don't, the reality. Your, your reality is not as good as your expectations, you're not happy. Now imagine the flip scenario. You get on a plane, when you buy your ticket, they say, we don't have Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. 20 minutes in the flight, they kick it on and they go, just to make everyone aware, mm -hmm. we have Wi-Fi, or not even that, you, have, you get 20 minutes of Wi-Fi. You know, you got 20 minutes of Wi-Fi, but that's better, it exceeded your expectation. Yep. You're happy, this is literally happiness. Happiness is not what people think it is. It's not pleasure in the moment. This is, it is, um, it is your expectations minus your reality. This is the same thing about like sports teams. You expect to, um, you're hoping the Patriots, right? The Patriots, if they, um, get knocked out in the first round of the playoffs, that is like an utter, like crushing defeat. That is horrible because the expectations is the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're the Jets, and you make it to the first round, or Buffalo this year, and you're, you make it the first round of the playoffs, they're pumped, they're yep. psyched because the expectations. Now, this is not about being a glass half, full, glass half full or half glass empty. It's not any of that. It's about being an extreme realist. These things are real possibilities. You are not probably as special and not, the, it is, the, the roads have not been paved for you the way they think they have. You're going to experience these things. So for us to have them and not, and be shocked when it does is kind of just like immature. It's not mm -hmm. responsible. You need to be able to realize these are things that are going to happen. So what we do when we go to the CrossFit Games is we list out everything that could go wrong. Expect adversity and expect to overcome it. Mm -hmm. So we list out everything that could go wrong. We, it could be 120 degrees while we're doing Murph. The, the, the ocean could have 25 foot swells. We could be in um, last place after the first event. Um, there might be traffic on the way to the, uh, event. They might not let you rest at all during, um, the night. You, the, the heat assignments might not be fair. There might be scoring errors. The judge is going to mess up. Now all of a sudden when these things happen, like you don't get thrown off. Yeah. You're cool. You expect these things and you create the contingency plans for all of them. Now it's impossible to create a contingency plan for every possible scenario. So all you have to do is realize this is the way the things go. Mm -hmm. Realize it's a part of life. It's a part of being a competitor. Like 
you're in the championship game and you're down by 20 points. Like, yeah, you're in the championship game. The other team's good. <laughs> like, this is going to happen. Yeah. Like, okay, now it's a chance for you to overcome. Now it's a chance for you to do this thing. Yeah. So expect uh, adversity. Expect to overcome it. Yeah, because reacting to because few people react well to surprises, right? That that's kind of that idea. Is if you if it doesn't surprise you, then then you can kind of stay within yourself, keep that awareness exactly, and, yeah, and yeah. act on purpose instead. So of So never act. be surprised. Right. Like why that you should never be surprised. Like yeah. all of these things are going to happen. Like you're um you're on uh, a a Division One lacrosse team, and you're expected to go play in the Final Four, and your three captains all get injured in the first two games. Like, yeah, like, okay, this is, this is sports. This happens. Like, don't get all bummed out. Don't get down. Same thing. You're in the first game of the season. You go down by four goals. Like, don't get bummed out. Don't get down. Like, compete regardless of circumstances. Like, it does not matter what's happening on. This is uh, Bill Walsh's coach, the 49ers. Like, ignore the scoreboard. Mm. It takes care of itself if you focus on giving your best effort that you can. This is leading us to our next step, which is setting your sights. So the next step, um, set your sights is all about realizing what's in your control and what's not. The scoreboard is not in your control. People getting injured is not in your control. All of these things that could go wrong are not in your control. We like to talk about with our athletes that we have five things in our control, training, nutrition, recovery, sleep, and mindset. In actuality, those things are not in our control. Mm -hmm. In actuality, you can only control one thing. As Epictetus would say, is your reasoned choice. What that means is you only have the the only thing that you can ultimately control is your mind. Mm -hmm. The only thing you can control because you could get some severe illness and it could take your body. You could be in prison in some foreign country. You could lose your legs. You could, there's so many things that could happen that are outside your control. If those things happen, the, only, the thing that's left that can never be taken from you is your mind. It's the only thing. Is your ability to respond to things. It's your ability to make the right decisions. Really what it comes down to as athletes and professionals and parents is your effort and your focus. Are you focused on the right things or are you distracted? Are you giving your full effort to what actually moves the needle or are you chasing something else? We got to make sure, and what I call this is set your sights. Mm -hmm. Literally, we do the exercise where we write down all those things. You just draw a circle around this very, very, very few things that you actually have control over. And it's so empowering because what was once distracted by 105 things is now focused on only five. And really, those five boil down to, we like to call it two, Mm -hmm. preparation and effort. If you just prepare as best as you can and give your, like, freaking best like like i'm not talking about like don't i'm talking like you only you know you and the person in the mirror know if you're giving your absolute best Mm -hmm. if you are the ultimately the best prepared and you work harder than anybody else that's the only thing that you really really have control over Mm -hmm. and that that preparation and effort can be applied to any number of things, right? So yeah. in that, in that, those five things, like preparation and effort towards nutrition, pr- preparation, Absolutely. effort. So it's not. Yeah. So people like, um, exactly. So people go like, uh, um, they keep the athletes longer at the games and it was announced, mm-hmm. right? That's outside of our control. But what's inside of our control is, did we bring enough food for that contingency? Mm. Yep. Like, we're going to, that's inside, that's preparation. You have to expect that type of thing to go wrong. And what it does, like you don't complain about that happening. Okay. So, um, you're traveling home from a business trip and your flight is canceled. Now you're going to miss your kid's birthday, right? We've talked about this on this, on this. Yeah. So if you flip out, lose your mind, you've now given control. You're literally giving your power, which is time, energy, money, resources, your stress, your power. Tom Brady calls it his power. Mm. When people talk about him crap, you know, whether it's like for um, deflate gate or anything else, you know, they've asked him like, you know, is that stuff bug you? And he's, why would I, his response is, why would I allow them to take my power? And you know, the, the Stoics talk about this is like, you cannot let outside people control your inside. That is the ultimate loss of power. You need to hold on to that with everything you have. The saying in the memes that you see on Instagram all the time now is like, did you really have a bad day? 
Or do you have a tough conversation with somebody for three minutes and let that wreck the rest of your day? Mm -hmm. If that's the case, you're focusing on things that are outside your control. Things that have already happened that are in the past, other people that you ultimately don't control. But what you do control is your response to those people, your response to those events, your response to those circumstances. You don't chose, you don't control the people, the events, or the circumstances. Only the way you respond to them. Is part of that preparation part of, or does part of that have to do with like, um, like positive or negative visualization? Like, do you? Is is that what you're doing when you think about, you know, going to the games, it might be 114 degrees. Like, yeah. is that, is that an effort of like what we've talked about before, like negative visualization? Like, so that's, let's, a, let's imagine what, that's a part of the previous step because okay. that's expecting adversity. So the story behind that is, you know, like when I learned about visualization, I learned about the way everyone does is like picture the perfect lift, picture the perfect right. speech, picture the perfect you going up to ask the girl out for a date, picture the perfect dot, dot, dot. And then if you picture it enough times, it actually, you know, just starts it to like manifest itself. Yeah. Through like, cause your body can't de- decipher between the unconscious and the subconscious, the subconscious, and the conscious. And actually like, it is like repetitions. Yeah. I, unfortunately that's not totally the case. Now there is power behind, um, positive visualization just like that, but you're not a special flower or snowflake. Like there are things that are going to go wrong. What you need to do instead, and this is Michael Phelps, who I learned from, is you have to visualize it going badly and then you positively yeah, that, overcome mm. the bad. That's the trick. Yeah, so it's a so hybrid gotta, of the two. You got to picture, if you're an Olympic lifting competition, you got to picture missing your first two snatches. Yeah. And then what are you going to bring to that first third lift? Not... First lift is going to go perfect. I'm going to go three for three and you miss your first two lifts and you're like, what happened? Like right. now you're chaos and like yeah. you're totally rattled. You have to picture Michael Phelps, your suit ripping. You have to picture your goggles filling up with water. You have to picture making the turn and coming up last place. You have to picture your foot slipping, coming off the blocks. You have to picture three false starts in a row. Now when all those things happen, I got a plan for that. Mm -hmm. He actually calls it putting in the videotape. Mm. Him and his coach, Bob Bowman, literally say, put in the videotape. And the videotape is whatever scenario actually pops up, they have a plan for it and they just execute that videotape. What you don't want to do is everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be amazing. And then all of a sudden something happens. You go, oh my gosh, four years of training down the tubes. There goes this race. And now you're a woe is me person. The biggest thing with mental toughness, weaponize your mind, what we're trying to do is eliminate that woe is me. Mm. Woe is me is feeling sorry for yourself. We're going to get to that a little bit later on. That is the most um, destructive thing that you can do as a human being is feel sorry for yourself. The saying is I've never seen a a sparrow, you know, um, a wild animal feel sorry for itself. I've seen sparrows like um, die frozen on a branch without for once feeling sorry for themselves. Like you are not freezing to death until you are on the brink of that. Like do not allow yourself a second of self-pity. Everyone is going through challenges. Everyone is going through hardship. Everyone is going through tough situations. It's only the people that deal with it appropriately that come out the best. Mm-hmm. This is not about finding ways to feel sorry for yourself. Do the opposite. See these things as opportunities to forge who you are as a human being. Mm-hmm. So uh, goggles filling with water, we might consider those um, like an outside trigger, but but then you say learn your trigger. So what is different about 110 degrees on the floor, goggles okay. filling versus what do, what you mean by learn your triggers? So what I mean by triggers is literally that it's an emotional response, a hormonal thing. It's that fight or flight. Yeah. So... Um, like if I was to say something mean to you right now, I'm not going to because I like you too much. But if I was to say something mean to you right now, there would literally be you, I, even without me saying it right now, yeah. I bet it's starting to happen. Yeah. Your stomach would start to do a little turn. Your heart would start to race a little bit. Your eyes would change. Mm-hmm. You would start to get a little bit different posture actually doing it right now. <laughs> so all these things would actually happen. Yeah. This is a hormonal response to your environment. This is your trigger. This is what we need to go back to. This is fight or flight. This is built into us. It's not our fault. What happens is something goes wrong, Mm -hmm. right? Which is um, somebody said something mean to you. Um, Someone cuts you off in traffic. Um, Coworker, dot, dot, dot. Um, Kid spills their orange juice at the breakfast table. You're in last place. You go down by 20 points. Um, Judge calls no rep on you. 
um, a bad workout pops up, like any one of these things, right? Because any of those things happen does not mean something bad is going to happen. It's only until we fill in the blank, do something, I'm going to talk about what that something is, that creates the good or the bad. Mm -hmm. What we need to do, this is Viktor Frankl says, between stimulus, the event, and the outcome, there's a space, Mm -hmm. there's a gap. And in that gap is your ability to respond. And your response is what this whole thing is about. Now here's what's hard, is something bad happens, And because you're a survival machine, your hormones are racing to go fight or flight and emotions flood you. You get frustrated, you get angry, you get heated, you get overwhelmed, you get whatever. It's all these things like, Patrick, get out of here, get out of here, or fight this guy, fight this guy. Like this this situation sucks, like do what you can to survive. All of those things are lying to you in that moment. Mm -hmm. We cannot be that reactive. And that's what reactive is. Reactive people listen to their emotions. What we need to do is instead be a professional, not an amateur. We need to be productive, not unproductive. We need to listen to our principles, not our feelings. And if we do those things, we will respond, not react appropriately. And this is how the best do it. When something bad happens, Tom Brady, after a horrible loss, his defense lifts up a bunch of points, there's, um, his wide receivers ran the wrong route. He doesn't get up there and blame other people, even though internally that's what's going on. It's fight or flight. It's not my fault. It's everybody else's. Internally, that's what's yelling at him, but he knows that he'll regret that later on. What we need to do is be able to bring perspective into the present moment. Everybody... I should say, most people have some level of perspective in hindsight. After the season, Tom Brady would go like, oh my God, I can't believe I blew up at that press conference and yelled at everyone, blamed all my, my, my coworkers and my teammates. What we need to be able to do is recognize that when you get those feelings, it's literally, this is an awareness thing. All of this is an awareness thing. When you get those feelings, when your spouse or your kids do something that kind of like sets you off. That's the trigger. When something's setting you off, you have to realize, go, oh, there it is. This is the hormones in me. This is the emotional response. What is the better, sorry, this is the the hormonal and this is the uh, emotional reaction. Mm -hmm. What is the appropriate way, the best possible way I could respond to this? When you flip that, this is kind of like, in the hero's journey, this would be the flipping moment. This is like Mm -hmm. the aha. This is when like shit's happening, it's going bad and you're you're realizing that you're getting angry and you go, whoop, that anger, that's the signal. It's a signal screaming at you, blaring at you that you're no longer focused on what you can control. That's all these things are, is blaring signals saying, Patrick, Patrick, you're focusing on the wrong things. Get back to what you can control. Responding, making the right choices, your mind, that's it. Now, if we can do that, there's some tactics we can do because it's really hard. The first one is awareness. So you feel your heart start racing. You Mm -hmm. feel angry, you feel adrenaline, you feel pissed off. Realize, oh, there it is, trigger. Now, the next thing is, what we want to do more than anything else is create space because space brings perspective. The best way to do that is to, I mean, it's just like, I, I, I don't, it's, it sounds hokey, but it's not, but it's like breathe. Mm-hmm. What you're doing is you're being stripped from the parasympathetic nervous system into the sympathetic nervous system. You are take, being taken from rest and digest where you make really good rational thoughts and thrust into fight or flight where it's all instinct and survival. Yep. You need to get yourself back into that. And the way you get back to that, remember, it's like parasympathetic is rest and digest. It's chill. It's calm. Athletes, it's called the zone or flow state. What we need to do is get back there. And the best way to do that is literally from is deep diaphragmatic breathing. If you get upset and you just breathe in, try to fill up your belly, not your chest, because that's shallow and mm-hmm. that's uncontrolled where your chest and shoulders are rising. That's where you're pissed off and now you're angry and you're gorilla and you're going to attack or you're going to, you're a, a, a gazelle and you're going to run away. 
What you need to do instead is get back to being a professional, get back to being um, calm, but get back to being zen, where you are flow. You do that by bringing oxygen back to your heart settles. And the best way to do it is with diaphragmatic breathing, you're trying to expand your belly, get it deep in, maybe pause for a second too and really expel it out. Three, four, five breaths. And then what happens is, you'll start to get in this routine and start to like all of a sudden you'll become, again, if you just become more and more aware of this thing, it shortens and it shortens and shortens. Mm-hmm. And then you get to the point where it's like, it's not as hard in certain situations as it is in others. Mm-hmm. Got it. Last one. Is it the last one? Kill the critic. Uh, there's two more actually. Yeah. So the second to last one. Second one. Um, yep. So kill, kill the, the critic. critic is we have this constant um, voice running through our heads and Everyone has it. You have it and I have it. We become aware of it somewhere in our teenage years um, that this thing is kind of like controlling our lives. And oh my gosh, this is like, um, um, this is really powerful. Mm -hmm. That voice in your head, if you let it be for most of us, is going to default to being a critic. Because it's trying to protect you? The job of the critic... Yes, exactly. Because it's, it's all, all falls back again. So it's looking, it's looking for negatives yep. because it's a lot more important that you remember that the big furry animal with the claws and the teeth can kill you right. than it is to remember that the butterfly is really pretty. Yep. That's really for a survival mechanism. You're looking for negatives, yep. right? Which berries kill you? Way more important than which ones taste better than the other ones. It doesn't matter which strawberries or blueberries taste better. It's more important to know that poison ivy is poison ivy, right? So we're on the lookout for negatives. So. Because of that, your voice is defaulting to this critic state. Well, the job of a critic is to point out every single negative that they can find. Key point, without any suggestions for improvements. Mm -hmm. That's not the job of the critic. What the critic does is go, this was wrong, this was wrong, this should have been done better. Wow, I can't believe they did this. Instead of being a critic, we need to learn it's not going to be there. We have to learn. We have to come aware and turn it into being a coach. The job of the coach is to look for opportunities yeah. to improve. Now that paradigm shift, you see something happen that's bad instead of like, like, oh, Patrick, you suck. There you go again. I told you you couldn't push hard in this workout. Mm-hmm. Instead, you look for opportunities. Go, okay, Round three, this is where it hurts. This is where it makes all the... Like, if your voice was displayed over a loudspeaker and everyone heard that voice inside your head, would you be proud of what it was saying? Mm-hmm. Or you kind of be like, ah. No one is going to coach you more than that voice inside your head. Do you want that coach to be negative and a critic and point out all the negatives or look for opportunities for improvements? Here's advanced class. That voice inside your head is not you. Mm -hmm. it's the biggest lie we've ever been told is that voice inside your head is who you are. It's not. It is a running commentary of your life. It's essentially you are the radio and the voice in your head is just the radio stations. The radio, the powerful thing is not the, it's not the DJs. It's not the talk show hosts. It is the radio, it is the thing, it is the being, it is the real thing. Everything else is just electrical currents. Mm -hmm. We have to realize that you are in your control. There's a saying that um, the voice, um, the voice in my head doesn't care what I do. It just wants to argue through and through. (laughs) That's all it is. Mm -hmm. It doesn't care if you get in the ice bath or not. It doesn't care if you have the salad. It doesn't care if you don't snooze. It doesn't care if you um, if you go to the workout. It doesn't care if you are super productive today. It just wants to argue back and forth about those things because we are pleasure-seeking machines that try to avoid pain at all costs. What we realize when we study high achievers is they flip that script. They endure short-term pain for long-term gain, where all the rest of us do the opposite. We are like, oh yes, ice cream, it tastes so good, amazing. Skip the workout, watch Netflix. Don't go to the gym, don't go to work early. Instead, stay under the covers. Like we just, we are hardwired again for survival. We are calorie preserving machines. From our DNA perspective, this is not our fault. You have to learn this stuff. It's all, we're hardwired for the opposite. 
but to be exceptional. We're hardwired to be mediocre in the middle of the bell curve. What we are hard, we, we need to do is rewrite that hard that 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 system and realize it's electrical currents that are messing with us. We need to realize that our we are not that thought. We control it. We need to shift but from being the critic to the coach. In fact, don't shift, just kill the damn critic. Last one is seek out opportunities. Okay, so this is um, where it actually happens. So nothing happens, you don't get good at any of this stuff without practicing it. Mm-hmm. Like at anything, you don't get good at muscle ups, you don't get good at being a public speaker, you don't get good at being um, a soccer coach, you don't get good at anything, painter, violinist, ER surgeon, doesn't matter without practice. Weaponizing your mind or being mentally tough doesn't happen without practice either. Now practice doesn't make perfect. You're never going to be perfect at this. You're always going to have faults. You're always going to have flaws. Because that happened doesn't mean you're bad. You just keep on practicing. Practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. Super old cliche. What you need to do is what you are practicing and doing over and over and over again is going to manifest itself when you are in the crisis moment. So we have to look for all these little moments in between for opportunities to practice this. So when you get cut off in traffic, Mm -hmm. when you are doing a hard workout, when your kid spills their juice on you at the breakfast table, those are all opportunities to go, oh, there's the hormonal response. Mm -hmm. I expected this. Let's control what I can control. Let's kill the critic. Let's just do it. And all of a sudden, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to respond to this. I'm not going to react. And all of a sudden, like, all of a sudden, these things become who you are. Now, this is essentially what, like, Everyone else is just skipping over and going to this. And they're going, do hard sprints. Mm -hmm. Do um, CrossFit workouts. Get David Goggins, run 100 miles. Like, um, do cold exposure baths. Like, if you do all those things, but you still have the critic inside your head, or you're like, why is me, the woe is me is popping Mm -hmm. up, or you're completely distracted, you can't follow the process, like, you're going to have a lot harder road. So the best thing to do is follow that process, then get to these things. And obviously it's not linear. You're going to be jumping all around and overlapping completely, but realize all these things, become aware of all these things as you go through those exposures. The next key point to that practice is we have to realize there is a learning zone. So there is survival, there is learning, and then there is comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Let's say um, you order something at a restaurant and they bring you um, um, your meal and it's got... um, Parmesan cheese when you ask for cheddar cheese and you're like, all right, no big deal. Like, okay, that's a really low level of adversity, right? Mm -hmm. That's not enough. That's your comfort zone. That's not enough to cause a hormonal reaction. But maybe something is in the middle of that. Like we named a few, like, um, like when your kid spills their coffee on you or your, their coffee on you, when the kid spills their drink on you, right? There's like a thing that's like, oh, here's a practice. Here's a moment. I'm going to seek this out. Here's a, that's a perfect sweet spot. This is why CrossFit's so good Mm -hmm. because for most of us, it's right in that sweet spot, right? It's not, oh, I got the wrong meal at the restaurant. It's also not the survival thing. Like, um, you're being, you've been diagnosed with cancer, right? Right. That like now, like that's really hard to stay mentally tough on, right? You get the call in the middle of the night that your loved one's been in a car accident. That's really, really hard in that moment to have all these things going on the right way. But what we can do is seek out those learning zones, those sweet spots and lean into them and be what we actually now become is super excited about those things. Yeah. Super hard workout, wow, awesome. Working out in uh, outside in the rain, awesome. Like if you're not if you if you're overwhelmed, you're not there yet. You got to back it up. Yeah. Um, that's why CrossFit because every single day someone's giving you something in your sweet spot. It's why Greg Glassman has said the greatest adaptation to CrossFit happens between the years. Because he knows this. Mm -hmm. He knows it's in the sweet spot for you to learn how to do all these things and become more mentally tough. Not only tough, but weaponize your mind so they can become an advantage. Realize that if we do these things, it's not like, um, you know, as David Goggins said, like, you can't hurt me. It's like a total advantage. This is how you become more productive in your life because you're no longer distracted by all the things going going on around us. Back in the, way back in the day, It wasn't as much of an issue because what you did was you were born, you were put into a trait, you learned it, you went to work with a a, a master, you became an apprentice, and you went through that. And there was no distractions at all. You basically became like a slave to um, to your task, to your labor. Now, there's a billion different things. Actually, 
a billion is an overstatement. There is um, 20,000 decisions the average person, I, I might get that wrong, I'm almost positive that's the number. 20,000 decisions the average person makes a day. Mm-hmm. Think of how many distractions there are, opportunities to go off the rails. We need to stay laser focused on what we are chasing. That is the level of mental fortitude I want to bring to this. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the I love what you said about CrossFit workouts being kind of in that sweet spot. Have you found any other... Um, maybe common sweet spot, like because uh, I love that idea of going towards them on purpose. Because yeah. they're they're uncomfortable, but they're not so uncomfortable that you need like three weeks of anxiety to to start them. So have you have you found any other CrossFit like you know sweet spots? You know, obviously not in the world of fitness, but yeah, I don't I don't know what they are. I'm just th- that's yeah, resonating so with me. Once so. you once you open your eyes to them, they are everywhere. Yeah. So literally, just go through your day. Um. The snooze, like the the very first great thing, example. the snooze yep. alarm, right? Like there it is. Like, okay, there's a thought in your head that's like trying to keep you in survival mode. It's a lot. What it wants to do is keep you comfortable. Okay, that's so the snooze alarm. Then right from there, it's like, do you have a morning routine? How easy is it to fall out of your morning routine? Yeah. Yep. That's mental toughness. From there, now you go to your morning commute. Okay, a guy cuts you off in traffic. You missed the light. You're gonna be five minutes late. Are you distracted about things you can't control? What's the the, the, mm. the little um, thing going through your head? Yep. Um, it's you live in the Northeast and it's crappy weather. Okay. Like are you complain about the weather. All these things are totally within our sweet spot. Mm. We just got to open our eyes. That's why I said in the very beginning, it's not about the tactics. It is about awareness. Step one of AA, like admit you have a problem, become aware of the whole thing. Alcoholics Anonymous is about awareness. It's an amazing, amazing program because it delivers results. This is too, but step number one is become aware. Talk to so many people and you know they're complainers and they don't realize it at all. And they're literally like, they are complaining. I've had this conversation with somebody where they're um, they're saying like, I can't believe that other people think I'm a complainer. And then the, literally the next sentence, they're complaining. Mm-hmm. And they don't realize it because they think that you're stating facts. The shortcut to this whole thing, becoming aware all this is never whine, never complain, never make excuses. Your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions, your actions dictate your destiny. Break the chain somewhere. The easiest one is not what's happening between your head. That's tough. That's tough. The easier one is don't let it come out of your mouth. Mm. Like to the point where like I'm so tired. I complaint. Like politics. I can't believe Trump. Dot dot dot. Complaining outside your control. The weather. Um, it's so freaking hot outside, like, um, whatever it is, like coworker, boss, like never complain. Like if you, I get it. Everyone's going to complain at some point, but try to become aware of it and minimize as much as you can. Never whine, never complain, never make excuses. All right. Wrapping this up, become a learner, expect adversity, set your sights, learn your triggers, kill the critic and seek out practice. And that Got is it. how we become mentally tough. Thanks, Ben. your mind. You can get every episode of Chasing Excellence wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Until next time, thank you for listening.